The documentation page for Raven has been significantly updated. I'll just kind of give you a quick demonstration of how to get there. So if you open up the Bloodhounds interface, uh, click on documentation, and let's make, let me widen this out a little bit. There we go. You'll see there's a menu on the right-hand side here, and if we scroll way down to the bottom, there's Raven. So if we click on that, and uh, so here's all the documentation up here. So nearly 100% complete. Um, you know, there's a lot to Raven, so I am almost done with it. Just a few little uh, bits and pieces left to add to this, but. Um, it's been significantly updated here. So, note down here at the bottom, there's some some tips down here uh, regarding uh, strategies and um, you know some Ninja Trader notes and information just regarding strategies in general and stuff like that. So, all right, let me close this out. Today I do have um, a couple of questions that had come in yesterday um, that I will cover first and then uh, we'll address other questions that come in. So the first one I'm going to address this morning is uh, the one that's on the left hand side here regarding the uh, various pivots points here and how to identify them pretty uh, simple conditions here. Um, so we're looking for pivot one when the triggers are moving up and for those of you who are, don't know what triggers are this is a next-gen uh, terminology uh, so in, in next-gen they have these moving averages here. It's the the gray lines here that are closer to the price. So I do have a chart that's somewhat set up and you can see I made them cyan. So these cyan lines are representative of the trigger lines there. All right. Um, so that will be the first question. And then uh, after once we're done with that, we'll get to uh, a SIFS question here on uh, figuring out this uh, special type of uh, reversal situation which involves the Keltner band as well. So, all right, um, with that, I guess let's get started here. As if is asking, can I use trigger lines instead of HMA? Actually, no, I can't. I don't have, let's see, actually I may have the trigger lines, but um, I prefer not to use custom indicators when possible because if other people would like to use you know this 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 same bloodhound work template you know they may not have those custom indicators right and to be honest with you you know I hope you guys know by now that it sh literally will take you 10 seconds to switch over from an HMA to the trigger lines um, you know so if I'm not using the exact same indicators I mean quite literally all you gotta do is just go over here um, you know, I'm probably I'm going to use a comparison solver. So all you got to do is go over here and change the indicator. I mean, how long is that going to take you to switch it over to the trigger lines versus the HMA? Um, but you know, for compatibility, for those who don't have these custom indicators, you know, I like to substitute ones. I like to substitute indicators that come with NinjaTrader, so that way other people don't have problems opening up these workshop, uh, these uh, Bloodhound. Uh, template files. So, good question there, as if. Yeah, so that's why I chose to use these HMAs because they're they're pretty close to the trigger lines. Um, all right, so what we're gonna figure out here, this first question, is we want to um, identify two points. We want to identify pivot one and pivot three. So we can see on the chart here we have pivot one, which is a a higher high and then we have pivot three which is a lower high and 
we're interested in identifying those pivot points when the moving average or um, in this exact case trigger lines the next gen trigger lines when uh, so when pivot one we want to identify that when the trigger lines are moving up or basically if you have a moving average that is moving up so we can see the uh, thin gray lines are both sloping up um, and then we want to identify pivot three the lower high when the trigger lines are moving down uh, now it doesn't say um, it doesn't say here how we want to identify them so I'm just gonna make an assumption and, and so with pivot one I'm gonna generate a short signal here uh, you know we can see in hindsight that um, you know we'd want to take a short there definitely at pivot one um, and same thing for pivot three. So I'll generate a short signal with uh, pivot three as well. So, uh, which is kind of, I think, a good exercise because um, you, we can see that we have the trigger lines are, are sloping in different directions. You know, so for pivot one, even though we're going to get a short signal, the moving averages are um, sloping up. So that's going to uh, require a slightly different logic than versus looking at pivot three because now the trigger lines are sloping down right so I think from that standpoint um, add a little more education to this example here all right so I already have uh, my chart uh, set up a little bit and you can see I have um, two HMA lines which I'll substitute for those uh, the, the trigger lines, the next gen trigger lines shown here on, on the uh, screenshot um, and then to identify the pivot points I have the SI swings highs lows indicator on here so let me just open up my indicator window and um, so you can see this is the SI swings, highs, lows, and on the chart, the thicker lines, right, the thicker magenta and the thicker um, lighter blue line are these whitest plots. So whitest plots here. So these whitest plots are identifying the lowest low and the highest high um, at any one particular point point. Uh, and the thinner lines, so you can see the, the, the darker magenta and we have a, a slightly darker blue, the thinner lines are the tightest tops and the tightest bottoms and think of those as intermediary highs and lows. Right? So the widest plots down here are identifying, um, this widest top is identifying the highest high um, in real time and the widest bottom is identifying the, the known lowest low and these tightest plots here are, are identifying um, higher lows and lower high points so we're going to need um, all four of these different plots right so pivot one that's going to be a highest high point so that one is going to use the widest tops plot to identify pivot one since it's the highest high but the third uh, pivot point is a lower high so that will require using the tightest tops so the tightest tops is what's identifying this lower high so and the second pivot you know even though we're not going to be identifying it if we wanted to find the second pivot point that would be the tightest bottom because this would be a higher low versus you know somewhere back here on the chart where we can't see that would be the lowest low um, and that would be the widest bottom so all right so with our chart set up Let's see, the first thing we want to do is 
um, start by naming our bloodhound file. So I'm just going to grab a um, previous name here in Right, and put today's date in there, the 28th. And let me just get rid of that solver there. Um, all right, so I like to kind of start simple. I like to keep it basic. Um, and so some of the simplest conditions here is when we're looking for right our moving averages to be moving up or our moving averages to be moving down. So let's let's start with that simple condition there. All right, so I'll, I'm going to switch over to the logic tab. And we need to start a new logic. And so we're going to be finding uh, pivot 1 first. And since we're looking at a moving average uh, slope, looking at the slope of the moving average, we'll just use the slope solver. Let's plug that in there. And uh, I am using an HMA25 and an HMA35 here in substitute of those trigger lines. So I'll just switch this moving average over the HMA and we'll change the period to 25 and we don't have to worry about selecting any plot there's only one plot available so we're good there all right simple enough uh, we can see we're getting a, a long output when the HMA is sloping up and a short output when sloping down all right, so next we'll do the same thing. Actually, before I go too far, let me name this solver here. All right, so this is the HMA25. All right, we'll set up the HMA35 now. So, all right, HMA35. Change our indicator. Change the period. And there we go. All right, now I'm going to make another assumption here. Um, so I'm making several assumptions here. So that's um, why I ask when you write in your rules that you be as explicit as you possibly can. Um, you know, because it just says um, when the triggers are moving up. So since you're using plural, the plural of triggers, I'm assuming that the triggers have to be in agreement. So to make the triggers in agreement, I'm going to use the AND node and connect them both in like so. And so now when we look at the chart, Right, we can see when both of the trigger lines are in agreement and whenever there is no racing stripe then that means the trigger lines are not in agreement and so therefore there won't be any signals occurring alright uh, so one of the conditions have been, has been met um, alright so we found when the moving averages is moving up or moving down so the next one is to find uh, pivot point one. One thing I noticed that really kind of makes this uh, pretty simple is, right, this is a Renko bar here. Um, and it is, it looks like some kind of special named full Renko uh, set to an eight tick. So it kind of looks like um, from... Let's see, the 8 tick 
looks like it's referring from the open of one bar to the close up of the next bar um, the reversal size appears to be 12 ticks in the reversal size because the, the body of these bars appears to be 4 ticks so I have been able to recreate that bar type with using the backtest Ranko right so you can see I'm using the the backtest Ranko and I set the bar size to 4 ticks the new new trending bar size to 4 ticks and a reversal of 12 ticks and so this looks pretty close um, if not exact to what was on the screenshot there and when you're using these Ranko bars um, they are really convenient with the swing indicator uh, because you can see that these uh, swing points or these pivot points are identified almost immediately so you can see as soon as we get this uh, reversal bar here you know as soon as this reversal bar occurs the next bar after the swing indicator is able to identify that um, right same same with this reversal bar the swing in indicator is able to identify it immediately afterwards um, we can see here that once in a while we do have like a one bar delay like right here uh, right here there's a, a one bar delay we can see there's a one bar gap in between um, so so from that standpoint that really kind of simplifies the logic here uh, so knowing that these uh, pivot points are identified nearly uh, you know on the next bar after uh, what I can do is I can do a simple comparison here so I'm going to compare the value um, of the swing indicator to the value of the previous bars high right and so that will help me identify a higher high and at the same time if I look back down here on this chart if I compare the swing indicators plot to the low of the previous bar I can see when a uh, lower low has occurred right so I can compare these two values to each other to find these um, uh, tops and bottoms so that's what I will do right here and oh, actually let's hold on let me see. I found a spot on the chart that looked very close to the screenshot that I was sent let me see let's see I marked it somewhere on here here we go yeah so I marked it last night with this white rectangle around it let me get this out of the way So I'm going to identify this as our pivot one point and this will be our pivot three point. So it looks pretty close to what we have on the chart here. All right, so once again, I'll be comparing the indicator value, the swing indicator value of this thick blue line, right, is going to be the widest tops plot. And I'll be comparing it to the high of this reversal bar. So let's drop down a comparison solver. Let's name this appropriately. So I'm going to be comparing the high and low to the um, let's see, swing high low indicator. All right. 
right, so indicator A is going to be our high and low plot. So let's switch over indicator A to the high and low value of the bar. And to do that, we're going to use chameleon. So with chameleon, I have the high and the low plots. So we're going to use the high, uh, high price to generate a short signal. Remember, I'm going to generate a short signal here at pivot 1 and at pivot 3. And at the same time, I'm going to build the opposite conditions. So we're going to use the low plot to generate a long signal. So if, um, if, if the same situation occurs, you know, like down here, then we'll generate a long signal down here. Okay, so we have, um, and also keep in mind, uh, we need to set the displacement to 1 because um, the, the swing indicator here starts plotting right on this bar, but we're comparing the value of the swing indicator to one bar back. So we have to use a displacement of 1, which means you know, look one bar back. Look at the value of the high and low price of one bar back. All right, now indicator B will be our swing high-low indicator. There we go. And so we're using the, the um, let's see, the widest tops, which is the highest high. Uh, for shorts, and we'll use the widest bottoms, which is the lowest low pivot points for longs. Now, we have a unique um, kind of comparison in this particular case. We're wanting to know when these values essentially are equal to each other. So you'll notice that um, Bloodhound, the, this the comparison solver's default output, right? It's giving us this long signal here and the short signal here. Uh, and that's because it's not checking to see when these values are, are equal, right? Remember, it, our long output and our short output, they're defaulted to look for when the indicator A here is greater than indicator B. So right now, the way the outputs are set up is we're comparing, you know, one value to be greater than the other value. But we're interested in this condition here where A and B are equal to each other, are essentially equal to each other. So what I'm going to do is clear the, these out, the default outputs out, set them to zero. And we're going to use this neutral condition for the output. All right. And so now you can see that um, these um, when the high and low of the bar is equal to the plot, now we're starting to get um, the signals that we're looking for. But also you'll notice that look what happens here when price punches through one of the swing indicator you know plotted lines um, we're getting a kind of a false signal so we need to filter this this signal out um, we'll get to that in just a moment um, you know so you know while this while this looks like it's working working nice and, and good you know I know kind of from from my programming experience that um, especially with NinjaTrader, uh, and it's not NinjaTrader's fault. It's 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 really um, it's kind of a, a bigger a bigger programming issue, and uh, with with uh, the CPU's math processor and stuff like that. So you know I don't main I don't want to blame NinjaTrader, but in working with NinjaTrader, kind of helps ex expose uh, this little technical glitch that happens once in a once in a while 
when you're making equal comparisons. So right now, um, this neutral setting is only looking for A to equal B when they're exactly equal or with, within zero ticks of each other. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little fudge factor in here. I'm going to put like 0.1 ticks of um, um, variance. So that way um, it kind of will overcome this technical programming glitch. So what that means is that the, the high price and the value of the swing indicator can vary by 0.1 ticks. So they don't have to be exactly, exactly equal. You know, in programming language, if I left this to zero, it has to be equal all the way out to like 16 decimal points. And that's kind of where the problem comes out, is when you compare stuff out to 16 decimal points, for some unknown reason, you know, sometimes they don't exactly equal each other. So when I put in this little fudge factor, um, it kind of... Um, breaks or, or, or gets rid of that 16 decimal point you know, um, glitch that happens sometimes. Oh. So that just builds in a little safety factor so they don't so the high and the swing indicator don't have to be exactly equal but they have to be within one ticks so as far as we're concerned that is equal enough. Alright so we've taken care of you know finding this higher high and these lower low points now we need to work on um, getting rid of these this guy right here and so one way I can do that is I can look for this reversal point right so these pivot points they're all reversal points right price is reversing on on each of these pivot points right that's Part of the definition of a, of a pivot is price reversing. So I can add that into a part of my requirements. So I will use the inflection solver, which an inflection is just a mathematical term for like change in direction, or in our case, kind of like a reversal in direction. So I will look for um, price to reverse in direction or inflect and since I'm looking for price I will change this over to the closing price and let's take a look here alright so pretty simple enough you can see every time price reverses we get our signal out of that um, but notice, let me compare. I'm going to connect the comparison solver back up. You see how? Uh, remember, I marked, I marked the bar where we actually got the signal. Remember, we don't get the signal until the swing indicator plots. But now, if I look at the inflection solver, right, the signal occurs one bar sooner, so they don't occur at the same time, and since I need both conditions to be true, right, if I connect them up with an AND node, you'll notice that now we're not getting any signals anymore because they don't occur on the same bar. So what I need to do is I need to modify, I'm going to modify this inflection solver. Um, to extend this reversal forward one bar and that's what this look back period can do so I'll change this look back period to two right and now you can see that the inflection solver is now giving us a short signal on the on the bar that we want so now if I look at both conditions together so now we have this um, higher high point identified we have this lower low identified and we got rid of this erroneous signal that was right there in the middle all 
right. Um, let's see. Now, what we need to do is connect these two together. Uh, now, notice that. Let's go back to our our trigger line condition. So I'm going to rename this. So this is our um, trigger. Uh, trigger. Let's see. I guess slope. And so when we look at what's coming out of this AND node, we notice that we're getting a long output, which is the opposite of what we want, right? We're looking for a short signal. So we need to reverse, uh, reverse this output here. Um, we do notice that we are getting an output on the correct bar here, as, as marked by marked by the arrow. I mean, I'll put a double arrow there to mark it. But instead of a long, we want a short output. Um, now, we want to reverse the signal. We do not want to invert it. So there is a difference between reversing versus um, inverting. Right? Inverting um, would invert, you see these, these blank areas where there is no racing stripe right if you look down here there's no bloodhound output and inversion and if we inverted the signals it would fill in these blank point these blank areas right we would get a long and a short because that 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 is a inversion of nothing so when there's no output if you invert that you get a full output when when there's no signal right so using the in invert values on each of these solvers is not the correct way to do it. We actually want to reverse the signals. So to reverse a signal, we can use the inverter. We do it does more than just invert. It also can be used to reverse a signal. Um, you can see here it has this option called swap the long and short. So if we set this to true, swapping um, is kind of a uh, basically is a reversal. And so we'll set this to true and we don't want to invert so we need to turn the inversion off. So we're going to turn the inversion off for the long and the short. And So now when we look at this now we can see that our signals have been swapped or reversed. So now we're getting a short out here. And our blank areas where there was no signal are still blank. So there, uh, the inversion um, reversed our signals. And if I like, I can rename this to a uh, reverse like so that way I know what it's doing okay and now we can take the final step and marry all of these conditions together So there is pivot one identified. Pivot one has been identified. Um, and kind of here's like the, the opposite as well. So this is the, uh, would be the um, lower low reversal of pivot one. And you'll see that we do have other signals here. However, um, you know, I don't, have enough information to know, you know, whether these are valid or not, you know, what's being used. So um, maybe, maybe we'll continue this later on this workshop, um, or maybe next week, um, depending if Jerry gets back to me today. But um, for now, we'll just move on to pivot three. So now we'll move on to finding pivot three here.
Now pivot 3 is very similar to finding pivot 1, except we're going to be using a different plot from the swing high low indicator. So we're going to be using the uh, tightest tops plot. So we're going to be using the thinner plot line because this is a lower high. Um, and also we're going to have to change the way that we look at our trigger lines because now our trigger lines are sloping down. So what I'll, uh, let's see, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to make a copy of this template here and rename it because we're going to find pivot three. All right, so to look at our instructions again, um, we want to identify pivot three when our trigger lines are moving down. So let's work on this part right here, moving down. And once again, I decided that we're going to generate a short signal here uh, for pivot three as well. Let me slide this over. So let's look <clears throat> at our trigger lines here. And <clears throat> we can see that um, when we just look at the signal coming out of the AND node that it is giving us a short output, which is what we're looking for ultimately. Right? The final signal, we do want a short output here. Um, so this doesn't need to be modified using the, this in, um, invert, inverter node. So I'm just going to get rid of it, and that part is good. All right, so our trigger line condition is already done, done for us. Um, so the next step is to um, find the pivot three, uh, right? So we just need to, um, we don't want to modify these solvers. If we modify these solvers here, what happens is it also modifies the solvers on this logic template. Right? They're the same solver, so if I modify one, it modifies the solver across all of my logic templates. So really, if I want to modify one of these guys, I need to make a new one. All right. <clears throat> so, and I know I need to make a new one because Remember, this comparison solver is looking at it's looking at the a different plot line. So when I open up the the swing high low indicator here, right, it's looking at our wise tops and wise bottoms. But for pivot three on on the chart, we want to use the tightest plots here. So I will have to change that, and so that's going to require me to, to make a, a new solver here. Um, but what I can do is I can take a little shortcut. So I'm going to take this this guy so because it's almost basically it's set up for me already. Right? This guy already has the correct output set for me. Um, it already has the high and low for chameleon set. Right? So what I'm going to do is I will make a copy of this solver. And um, you know I should kind of modify the names a little bit here. So how about if I call this P1 for pivot one, and I'll name this guy, this solver, P3 for pivot three. Now I can tell the two apart. Um, so I just made a copy of it. So the next thing I'll do is, let's see, first let me make sure I've got the correct logic template selected. So we're on the pivot three one. So I'm going to remove this off the board, and I will add that P3 one, the new one down here, and I'm going to connect it up to our result node um, while I get this solver set up correctly. So what I'm going to, what all really all I need to do is just switch this over to the different 
um, to the different plots. So remember these these plots. Uh, this plot is identifying higher lows, and this plot is identifying lower highs. And as soon as I switch that over, right, I can see now that all these little intermediary um, swing points are being identified here. And now this um, higher high is not being identified and neither is this, this lower low. And we have this erroneous signal here because because we're just looking at this one solver. Remember, we're just looking at this one solver. So remember, the way that we got rid of this erroneous signal right here is we used the inflection solver at the same time. All right, so let me connect this guy into the AND node. And we'll take a look at the AND node. So this is both of both solvers connected together. Right, and so now I got rid of that erroneous signal there in the middle of the trend. And now we just have our uh, essentially our pivot two and pivot three identified. So next I think all we need to do is just connect everything together into one last AND node. And there is our pivot three. Just like so. And that was it. Um, for those of you who know about how, how AND and OR logic works, you know, you probably realize that I could take these solvers, essentially I, I could take all four of these solvers and just connect them all into one AND node if I want. Um, right, so when you have a bunch of AND nodes just connected together like that, essentially it just make, it's the same thing. It's the equivalent of just having one big AND node. So I don't have to use three separate AND nodes if I do not want to. Um, you know, but I do just because it helps Visually, it helps you see, you know, the different logics. It helps you separate the different conditions, right? So this this AND node, you know, is representing the conditions of the trigger lines, and this AND node is representing the condition for uh, essentially pivot three. So that's what this guy is doing. And if I switch over to the pivot one logic template, I can also name that one because this that and node is finding pivot one. So, you know, by keeping all these and nodes separate, uh, I can name them. So that way, I know later on, you know, what what kind of the condition is that this, these logic nodes are finding for me. Uh, However, in, in pivot one, I, because I have this reversal in between, I can't disconnect all of my I can't connect all of my solvers into one AND node because we do have this uh, reversal condition in the middle here. So that concludes the first um, the first question here. So before I move on to uh, Sif's question, let's see, Jerry wrote in a quick question here. So he's asking, so if I get a correct pivot 1 and pivot 3 comes, uh, that is what I want to show. Oh, okay. Um, so it sounds like ultimately what Jerry wants is the last signal from pivot 3 only. So finding pivot one was kind of like the the first criteria for the um, trade setup, and it sounds like pivot three is when you actually take the trade. 
So I think what, uh, okay, Jerry's saying yes. All right. So what Jerry is looking for is that binding pivot one is kind of like the pre-setup condition. And you don't really take the trade until you get to pivot three. So to build a final signal, right, we need to marry these two conditions together. Um, all right, so we can do that. And let's see, I will, to do that, I'm going to build a third logic template. So I'm going to copy pivot one. And I'll just name this pivot one plus three. So I have kind of a decision to make here. Um, you know, how do I connect these two signals together? So I have pivot one and I have pivot three. So I need to marry these two um, signals together. So there, I just got them, just marking them. So to get the signal from the first condition of pivot one uh, over, so it's essentially what I have to do is I have to take this condition that I've got and I need to extend it forward to the pivot three condition. Um, so that way Essentially, our logic is saying that both conditions have happened. And there's a couple ways I can do this. I can try and use the toggle node to um, turn on. Let's see, I can use the toggle node to try and extend pivot one forward to the, pit, the pivot three. Or I could use the um, signal extender. Let's see. I could use the toggle, which is probably a little more complicated, um, or the signal extender. It's, that's a little simpler. Or I could use this look back. I'm going to build, let's see, let me name this. So this is, um, I'm going to build pivot three on here as well. So this is uh, pivot one. And remember, I had these AND nodes named as well. So pivot one, pivot one, and let me just rename these AND nodes real quick. and tidy. I'm going to rearrange my logic nodes a little bit. So because these this trigger condition is um, required in uh, is required in finding the pivot one and pivot three, I'm going to put this in the middle and all right next I will build the logic to find this pivot three. So essentially I'm just kind of reassembling the logic um, to find the pivot three condition here. Yeah, 
yeah so if we um, right so if we look at what's coming out of this AND node um, right this is binding our our pivot 3 situation over here and remember this is the complete logic for finding pivot 1 uh, to complete the logic to find pivot 3 remember I also need to use this trigger logic as well so what I will do is take our trigger trigger condition our trigger logic combine it with our pivot 3 logic and now this will find pivot 3 so so if we look at right if we look at this logic here that you can see sliding around this logic now is exactly the same as what I built on this pivot 3 logic template right so this it's this exact same logic so all I did was just rebuild it um, right right down here so now you can see why I put this trigger logic in the middle because um, it's used um, for both pivot 1 and the pivot 3 condition all right so now we're ready to drop the signal extender in we'll kind of shrink things up a little bit and now we kind of have to make an arbitrary decision with the signal extender you know I have to make an arbitrary decision of you know how many bars forward do we want to extend extend the signal so we can see right now you know right now that the signal extender is set to five bars by default right so we can see that I have five bars of a signal extender forward um, and it looks like I need another five so I will just put in ten for now um, you know realistically you may need 15 you may need 20 you know that's a, an arbitrary decision you have to make yourself um, you know to decide you know how long are you willing to wait for pivot 3 to occur you know to, to decide you know if the trade is still valid you know typically the, the longer the time you wait from you know from your your precondition in other words is pivot one to pivot three that typically the longer you wait between those conditions usually the higher the failure rate is you know of your final trade setup to uh, you know become a winning trade um, so so uh, an arbitrary decision kinda has to be made when you're using the signal extender you know how many bars you want allowed to go by um, so you know I'll just say I'll just bump this up to 15 signals here um, to give us a little leeway and so now I need another AND node well I'm adding another AND node just, just for visual representation Right, connect that AND node in and then connect pivot 3 to this and voila there is the simple condition so let's take a look at pivot 3 only because pivot 3 right is kind of what triggers triggers the trade all right so here's kind of some uh, you know pivot three conditions only met um, and so now with pivot one in combination it should eliminate those let's see um, well it eliminated one of them but you know we can see that technically 
this is the highest high relatively looking back um, you know but we can see that there actually is a some higher highs back here but as far as the indicator knows relative um, relatively we do have a lower low made before this um, before this higher high was made right so we did have a lower low and uh, let's see that we did have a higher low made um, so there are some ways that you can work with this Jerry to kind of filter this out and that's essentially working with the swing indicator so what you can do is um, you can adjust the swing sensitivity a little bit um, and also you can adjust the number of swings so if I up this to let's see up to five now I can see it's gonna make a a difference on on my chart um, that's not going to affect Bloodhound. I'm only affecting what I'm seeing on my chart. Now if I come back here, let's see. Um, hmm. So I can see that changing that, you know, I still have pivot one found. Unfortunately, pivot three is not going to be found because look at how many bars go by for the um, tightest tops plot. So this this lower high is not found, is not identified by the um, indicator until several more bars go by. Um, let's try setting this to four and see if that helps. So maybe that will help. Let's take a look forward here. Um, hmm. No, that's not going to help. Um, What I'm doing is I'm just kind of looking at the behavior of the indicator to try and figure out some other conditions that I can add to kind of filter out um, to you know filter out this guy right here. Uh, well, but you know at the same time I don't know maybe this is would be kind of a valid setup for you there. Um, definitely kind of looks like there's more back testing to do so that you can. Um, so you can evaluate how it is right now um, and then maybe apply some additional rules later on. You know, one thing I can see is if I wanted to make sure that I really had um, this extreme higher high found, I can, if I, I'm looking at the plot right here and I can see that previously, see how the thicker blue plot line steps up? So that tells me I went from this, the previous highest high was a little bit lower than, than this highest high, right? So I had this stepping up increase um, in the indicator plot. So that's one thing I could possibly use um, to, so that's one thing I could possibly use over here in this area, right? Because I can see that what's happening is Remember that plot, this widest tops plot, is actually stepping down. So I could build a, a, you know, another condition that if I find this stepping down, that, you know, it would essentially kind of kill this, this signal right here. So I could 
add in a condition. Effectively, I would add in a condition that looks for the indicator to step up. All right, uh, but you know, to be fair to uh, as if, I'm going to stop it right there because I don't have enough information to kind of carry this on further. So for right now, the immediate goal has been met, and so we'll stop it right there, and we'll move on to Asif's question. All right, so what we have here is we have a, uh, let's see, uh, it's either a Bollinger Band or a Keltner. It's a Keltner channel. All right, so we have a Keltner channel, and we're looking for uh, several different um, price action within the bars. So the Keltner channel is really the only indicator we're working with and the rest of it is looking for uh, price action. So we can we can see here that um, the the last up bar, the last green up bar needs to have a wick. right? So it needs to have a tail on it. And then at this reversal point or at this inflection point it needs to happen um, near or at the upper Keltner band, right? Um, and then what's also included is that this reversal bar needs to have a wick. And um, I can tell you that uh, the way these bars are working, you know, there's always going to be a wick at this reversal down point. However, um, we're going to look for this wick to be, you know, a certain number of ticks uh, close to the Keltner band. So uh, we'll use that to our advantage. And then the signal will actually occur on the second down bar. So I guess that's uh, just in case we want to make sure that we're not getting whipsawed around so we're not want to make sure that we kind of filter out a uh, reverse down and then a reverse back up. So we'll wait for this second down bar to occur. Okay, there we go. So let's find an ideal situation to work with. All right, how about right here? We'll use this as our ideal situation to work with. I'm going to start by naming our system here. And I guess I'll just call this B. Alright, so now I have a decision to make. Which, which one of these conditions do I want to start looking for first? Um, I don't see any of them as being really simpler than the other um, other than well I could just use for this I can I'll look for this reversal in price first that is definitely the easiest all right so there's a simple name for our system. Um, Alright, so the first simple condition I'm going to look for is just look for price to be reversing. So I'm using the inflection solver, right, and I'm going to change the, uh, the type over to the closing price, and uh, there we go, pretty simple. Now, keep in mind we're looking for a signal on the second bar so as I look at the chart, right, we want we want a signal on this second bar here. So I need to extend this reversal forward another. So there we go. Now that inflection solver is now painting a signal on top of the bar where we're actually looking for a signal. Alright, let me just 
name this. All right, let's now we'll move on and we'll build this first condition here where we're looking for a wick prior to the reversal. So looking for wicks, essentially, essentially what we're doing is we're um, making sure that the low of the bar is less than the open or in the opposite situation, we're making sure that the high of the bar is higher than the open. All right, so we're making sure that there's a difference between the low to the open and the high of the bar to the open and that tells us if there's a wick. Right, if the low and the if you know like like all these bars here in the middle, if the low equals the open, then we know that there's no wick. So let's use a comparison solver to look for that. And let's find on our chart. All right, so. Here's a wick on this bar here. And I just now noticed that there's no wick on this bar. So this actually won't isn't our ideal situation. So I'll have to find another one. But let me just kind of build this condition on, you know, I can just find any bar here. Any bar will work. Let me thicken up the wicks. There we go, a little thicker wick. So we'll find this bar here with the wick on it. All right, so we're gonna be um, making sure, like in, in this situation, uh, we're making sure that the open is greater than the low or we're making sure that the low is less than the open so and keep in mind that even though this this is remember these are up bars but we're actually looking for a short signal so we kind of have to reverse the logic on this um, you know re reverse the the signals coming out So I'm going to use Chameleon to get my price points. Oops, not, not Bloodhound, Chameleon. There we go, one more down. There's Chameleon. And let's see. I'll start with the open. I'll look at the opening price first. And then compare it to the high and the low price of the bar. So we're going to be using the low of the bar. So when we're when we have an up bar, we're comparing the low of the bar to the open, but we want a short output from that situation. So the low of the bar we're going to be using for shorts and we'll be using the high of the bar for longs. And um Great, so we can see the default outputs for the solver are giving us kind of an, an opposite effect. So what I can do um, is clear this out. I'll clear my outputs. And essentially, I think I just need to reverse them. Yep, so there we go. Um, that essentially reversed them. All right, and we're going to need to apply some filters here as well. Yeah, so let's apply another filter. Um, how about if we just use a simple one here? Let's see, 
Let's use the bar direction. And when we look at the bar direction, right, it's giving us a long when the bar is moving up. But remember, we're wanting a short, uh, we want a short output from, from bars with these wicks. So let's see, let's, let's do this the proper way. You, you know, with, with, with these Ranko bars, I could use the inversion here with the Ranko bars because there are, uh, because Ranko bars always have kind of like a bar direction. Um, but if I was using this on a range bar, um, it wouldn't, this invert wouldn't work with a range bar. Um, you know, possibly other bars it wouldn't work. You know, so the proper way to do that is to use the in inverter to reverse the outputs. So just as we did with the previous question, let's um, turn the swap on, turn the inverts off, and now essentially this became a uh, reverse, a reversal. Kind of function node. All right, and let's marry these two conditions together with an AND node. This is working good. We can see this is working good for the up bars. However, the down bars, something is not quite right with our logic. Let me... Okay. That looks good. So it must be the comparison solver here. So let's see. Let me put, let me put a name in here first. So we're comparing the open to the high and low of the bar and So I might have gotten, let's see, no? Hmm. Now well, one thing, let's see, um, one thing I should do is add a large amount here. Um, yeah, there we go. That's what was needed. Should have done that from the beginning. Um, okay, let me go back to my um, my outputs here. So as I'm looking at my up bars, um, you know I can see that uh, you know what I what I should have done is in this large amount. Um, remember, we need the the indicator A is is representing our the opening price indicator B is representing the low of the bar or the high of the bar and for there to be a wick there has to be at least a one tick difference between the two correct so if we look at how this reads right this says a which is the open um, is greater than B which is the low of the bar by one tick so we need at least one tick difference between the open of the bar and the low of the bar to be a wick. So I should have started by putting a one tick difference in here. Um, and you remember how when I was talking about how um, you know this 
floating point issue with comparing things being equal out to 16 decimal points. Um, so you notice when I set this to zero, um, it's working on the short side. Right? It seems to be working on the short side. Um, you know, and that's because of this floating point um, issue that happens um, with you know software doing math. Um, however, if I turn off my shorts and I work with my long output, um, see it, it, that that issue is not happening with the long output, and so if we look at the long output, um, essentially A is the open, is less than B, the high, by, well, it says one, two, let me, let me update, update that display, there we go. So when A, which is the opening price, is less than B, the high of the bar by zero ticks, um, you know, and so this is true. If we look at these bars here, let me, you know, if we look at these bars here, right, with no wick, the open and the high are zero ticks apart. So there, that, that is true. So technically, this is true. I should be getting this long, uh, these long outputs here. Um, you know, so while it's working correctly on the long side, because of that 16 decimal point, you know, floating point issue, it's not working correctly on the short side. Uh, and, you know, it was kind of to our advantage, but still that can add confusion to this. So what I'm going to do uh, to compensate for that is I'll put in here 0 0.9 like that. And now as I set these up, right, so now look at look at when we have the long output on the on these down bars. So now I only get a long output on the down bars when there's actually a, a wick here. So now if we look at at uh, the uh, the filtered part, now it's outputting correctly. I'll name my end node wicks. And so now we can see that whenever we have a wick, it's being identified. All right. So we've got the first condition figured out. So if we go back to our screenshot here, so our first condition is looking for looking for a wick prior to the reversal. So we're finding our wicks. Now I just need to find uh, an, a location on the chart where the signal will actually occur. Here we go. Great, I found one. So right in here. Okay, good. So remember, we're looking at our wicks condition. So we found this wick prior to the reversal. And remember, this, this is the bar that we're looking for the signal on. So we can see I need to extend this short signal here forward three bars. And I think the way I'll do that is I'll just use this look back. I'll use the look back node. Keep it simple. Put that in there. You'll see that the look back node has this displacement feature as well. And so I can uh, see, I think I just need to displace it, what, two bars? Yep. 
So there we go. <clears throat> um, so now I'm getting a short on the correct bar here. All right, let me add in our reversal condition. So I need to tie these all together with an AND node. So we'll connect that in there. Connect this in. All right. So we have two conditions met. Uh, right, so we have the wick. Um, we have a price reversal. Now we need to find our third condition, which is looking for price to be next to the Keltner band here. So um, what we'll simply do is compare the high price of the bar to the Keltner band and make sure that they're uh, within a certain distance of each other. So I'll grab a comparison solver and we'll work on just this condition by itself. So let's see, um, I'll just, I'll put the Keltner band in indicator A, or the Keltner channel, and all right, so our offset is 4 and the period is 45 and we're using the upper band to generate a short signal right so when price approaches the upper band we want to get short so that means we're going to use the lower band for long signals okay next in indicator B that's going to be the high and the low price of the bar so we'll use SI chameleon And once again, so for the high, we're using the high of the bar to generate a short output, and we're using the low of the bar to generate a long output, right? So it's the, the high of the bar up here that we're comparing to the Keltner channel to generate a short signal. So, and... So what we're looking for is we're looking for these two to be um, essentially kind of equal to each other within a certain uh, variance, within a certain uh, distance from each other. So once again, we're going to use this neutral output again. So we kind of have a running theme here in using this neutral output today. So let me clear out all my outputs here, set them all to zero and I want to use the neutral so I'm going to set this to 1 now remember right now they need to equal each other exactly that's rarely going to happen so let me put in a variance here how about I'll put in a 2 tick allowance and alright so now we can see whenever the high of the bar is within 2 ticks um, that condition is met. And so now what what all that's left is oh, well two things left. Let me put a proper name in here first. Alright, so we're comparing the right the high and low to um, the K band. Okay, good. Now that I got this named, now all I need to do is just connect it into this AND node, and nothing. So what 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 was forgotten here? Let's take a look at this. So if you notice. We're not getting an output on the correct bar. Um, so remember, we're waiting for the second down bar to occur. Um, 
So we need to, um, there's two ways I can shift our signals forward. Right, I can use the displacement that's built into this. Right, so I could just say displace it by one and displace this by one. And right, that did it right there. Or I could have grabbed just another look back node at, at the same time. Um, so there's two ways I could have done that, right? I could have used this as is, and then I could just drop in a look back node. And it already defaults to a displacement of one, right? So now we can see that the signal, right, or this condition has been shifted forward one bar on the correct bar. So that would work for us as well. So now if we look at this, this looks, it looks like we're done. Um, but I know, you know, in thinking this through, you know, what would happen if this reversed to an up bar? You know, what if this, you know, reversed back up? You know, the way this is built now, it would still give us a short signal. So what we want to do is add a, an additional filter of the bar direction. All right, so we'll drop in a simple bar direction um, and this will be like a fourth kind of condition to add in here. And essentially, that is it. Well, let's see what happened here. It looks like we should get a, a signal right there. Let's find out what happened. Um, most likely, let me slide the chart forward there. And so what I can do is I can connect all my various conditions in. Right, so the bar direction is obviously working correctly. Let's take a look at the high and low to the band. Let's see, that's working correctly. And let's take a look at the wick condition. All right, so remember this is looking for wicks. And so there's, there's where our problem lies. There was no wick um, prior to this reversal bar. So that's why this didn't work out. Um, Let's see, there's no wick there. And let's see, no wick. Um, well, actually, we're not near the, the band or the channel. We're right in the middle of the channel here. Here we go. Oh, there is no wick. So, hmm, no wick there. Let's see, no, nope, there was no wick prior to the reversal on this either. And there's no wick there either. So this is a very selective system. Let's see, no, no wick, no wick on that reversal bar there. And that's all. I only loaded up uh, like three days of data. Um, but essentially that's it. Done. Um, here, let me... Oh, here we... Oh, uh, we do have... Hmm, interesting. All right, we do have a signal. Oh, we have a signal one bar early. Ah, that's good I found this. All right. So, that's right we need to make sure that there's two bars, two bars in the same direction after the reversal. So it's a good thing I found that. Let's fix that real quick. That'll be pretty simple. Um, what we can just do is use this bar direction solver to fix that. 
So remember this bar direction solver is just looking for one bar, but if we in the in any direction. If we change this to requiring to two bars in the same direction, um, right now you can see we don't get a signal until we get to the second bar in in the same direction. Um, you'll notice there's this mode right here. So right now it's set to per, to percent. So we can see that on the first first bar in the in in a direction, we're getting you know, like half of an output, a 0.5, and that's because it's set to percentage. We can set it to all or nothing, right? And then that bar will be empty. So you know, in in, in this situation, it doesn't matter which mode we use here, but uh, you know, we'll just leave it on all or nothing. Um, like that. So now if we take a look at this. Alright, so that got rid of this this filter right. That got rid of that signal. So there was no wick on the bar prior to the reversal. So no signal. Alright, you're welcome, Asif. Alright, till next Friday. You guys have a good rest of your week.